Welcome to video 17 in our van build series. Today we're going to tackle one, just one, interior wall in our van. Why just one? Because this wall is unique. It won't be upholstered, padded, or even have any fabric on it. It won't even be made of wood. We're going to build our kitchen galley wall. And we're going to make it out of recycled sheet aluminum. With a little polishing, our goal is to end up with a stainless steel look-alike for our kitchen backsplash. Because of the overall complexity of a kitchen, this video will touch on plumbing, both water supply and drainage, electrical, both 12 volt and 110, basic wiring, installing a switch panel, battery monitor, a remote inverter switch, two 110 outlets, and cutting and polishing and riveting aluminum. We have a lot of work to do inside the wall before we can build our kitchen cabinets. Enough talk, let's get started. Although I won't be tackling all of our van's plumbing requirements here, I will have a separate video on water supply. I do have to fabricate and install the water supply line that will be hidden inside the wall behind the sink. Here I'm using standard one half inch PEX pipe, a few 90 degree elbows, PEX cinch clamps, and connecting them all together with a PEX crimping tool. The ProMaster pillars make it really easy to install and conceal this type of water line. Here I'm testing our switch and power supply panel. We chose the Marine Boat Rocker Switch panel that includes a 12 volt socket, two USB power plugs, and a voltage meter. The faceplate is aluminum and the switch and plug quality appear to be high. Just going to take 10 seconds here and show how this switch is wired. Uh, there's two silver and one copper connection. The silver is the actual switch. The two silver is the switch component. And so in this case, I'm running power into the switch and there's no power coming out of the switch to the appliance. As soon as I turn the switch on, this now uh, is closed and power gets to the uh, uh, to the light and the ground from the light goes back to the battery. So this one over here has got nothing to do with appliance. This one here is just providing a ground for the bulb inside the light. You see that? So I can disconnect this, still have the appliance working, but now the bulb here does not light up. And we may do that on certain appliances, i.e. appliances that you're using at night. Maybe you want to, um, switch activate your USB uh, connectors because you charge your cell phones at night. We will disconnect this to make sure that light doesn't stay on all night and light up the van. However, for something like this light, i.e. your overhead lights, I'll probably leave it connected. Therefore, when you turn the lights on, there's an indication of which light or which switch is currently active. Although I previously installed rough-in wiring for light fixtures and other appliances, I now have a central located switch panel selected where I want to control them from. For this reason, I had to cut into the pre-installed electrical positive line and run a dedicated line to the switch panel to control the appliance remotely. For the most part, I hate working over my head, especially soldering over my head. I have burnt myself countless times. For the record, I have a towel over my legs trying to protect myself, and I'm limiting the amount of solder that I'm adding to the connection. If you look closely, you'll see that I've already slipped the heat shrink tube on before I started the soldering. Also, I'm making use of a helping hand soldering aid just to add some tension to the line while I apply reasonable pressure with the soldering gun. The heat gun makes quick job of the heat shrink tubing, permanently sealing and protecting the line. With some basic rough in wiring complete, time to start making our stainless steel look-alike aluminum wall. I started by tracing some of the curved structures unique to the ProMaster. 
I then transferred these cardboard cutouts to my recycled aluminum sheet. I have a, uh, a rough fitting here now. A little bit of filing left to do on this 1 8 inch aluminum. Got a couple pilot Clecos holding it in place. A little bit more trimming in here needed. I've got to refine this area around here. But for the most part, that is going to be two thirds of the panel. I'll start working on the second half and then of course do a, a beautiful aircraft seam between the two of them. I've placed Clecos, which will eventually be rivets, about every eight centimeters. Not quite aviation standards, but I never really had any plans to make this van airworthy. I just used a circular saw to cut the 1 8 inch aluminum. Now this is a simple but handy tool. It's called a rivet fan spacing tool. You expand the tool to your desired space between rivets and it then ensures all holes are equally spaced and aligned at the same time. Here I'm making the center seam between the two separate sheets of aluminum. Back on the workbench, I'm back using the rivet fan spacing tool to ensure all of these rivets are uniform. With the two sheets of aluminum now cut to size, fitted and joined, time to start to make the cutouts for some of our appliances. Here I'm cutting holes for our Renergy battery monitor and our Renergy 2000 watt remote inverter switch. I've placed these in a position where they can easily be read from within the cabin as well as the person sitting in the passenger seat, they can view it while driving to check perhaps the charging status. Next item to tackle are the 210 volt plugs and the switches and USB panel. Same as before, I used a jigsaw with a little tape to protect the aluminum face. With all of our holes cut, including the water supply line and future cabinet mounting holes, one visible here, which will allow us to fasten our kitchen cabinet directly to the frame, we are now starting on our polish work. Now, neither Linda or I have any experience with polishing metal. However, we watched a handful of videos and two things seem to work for us. WD-40 and a 3M Scotch-Brite pad which we are using here. We followed by using Mother's Mag and Aluminum Polish. The Scotch-Brite pad was pure elbow work. The Mother's Mag and Aluminum Polish was applied using a homemade metal buffing wheel attachment I made for our drill. Like all aluminum polish work, the longer you work at it, the better it looks. We stopped at a point where we had removed all of the used crud from the metal. The metal was clean and it no longer drew attention to itself. If we get bored, we could probably take another go at this, but I'm pretty happy with our finished result. It sort of looks somewhere between brushed aluminum and stainless steel. We really like it. Plus, it will be super easy to clean as a kitchen backsplash. I'm not adding any more cleaner, so I think we're there. Is it perfect? Nope. We're sure a lot better than when we started. Okay. Well, I'm just wrapping up the end of another day. I'm going to uh, focus today was essentially uh, wiring again. Um, I'll show you where I've left off. This uh, access panel here is essentially going to be housing this. Um, five switches. In the end, there'll only be four switches because I'll be replacing this with a dimmer. So from left to right, there'll be a switch for the um, the, uh, the cabin lights, six hockey pucks embedded in the ceiling, and a dimmer for that. The next one over will be uh, counter lights, uh, so the two hockey pucks directly above the sink. Uh, next to that will be a water pump, and this last switch is going to activate both the USB, the voltage, and the 12-volt plug-in. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, some thoughts on how I'm going to be breaking down the use of these uh, lights here. 
certainly for things like water pump, when you turn it on, that light will be on because the water pump, as soon as it pressurizes, um, it stops running and you want to have a visual clue that you still have power going to the water pump. So that'll be on. Uh, other cases, for example, maybe the turning on of the USBs, I will not wire in uh, the, the bulb for that because uh, I don't want a light on all night when we're charging cell phones and so forth. So uh, over to this area here, essentially you've got four sets of wires. Um, all of these are going back to the appliances now. This is the, uh, or rather to the fuse box. This is the USB and cigarette. These are the counter lights. Actually, they'll come through here. So later when I put up a, a, a overhead cabinet, they'll light up. Uh, we also have the, uh, uh, the overhead uh, hockey pucks. And you can see all the rough in for all of those. And the last one here would be the, uh, the water pump. And the water pump is going to be down in this area. Other things that we have on the wall here, uh, below that, this will be a 110 plug for toaster. Uh, coffee maker, that kind of thing. And uh, the cabinet will be going in here. So way down at the bottom here will be the microwave. And of course, I've got a 110 plug for that as well. Here's the water supply. Tomorrow, I'll we'll start working on the drain to go into the gray water tank, which I installed about half a year ago. I ran a standard 14.2 household 110 wire from the inverter at the back of the van. Here, I'm installing 210 volt plugs black in color to match other switches on the wall in the vicinity. You'll notice I have chosen to use the push-in backwired method. I have chosen to do this not because I'm lazy, I just wanted to ensure the screw connectors on the side of these receptacles are completely turned in, as flush as possible. And I went a step further, here I'm wrapping the walls of the 110 receptacle in electrical tape. I know it's not needed. It's just one extra step of electrical insulation and protection. With both 110 plugs wired, I quickly tested the wiring by plugging in a trouble light. Being fully transparent, this is the second dimmer switch I purchased. Twice the price of the first one, but this one works. I'll provide a link in the description. You definitely get what you pay for. Just as an FYI, it also comes with a diode. So if you're planning on making a fan or other electric motor variable speed, you could use this dimmer switch to do it. You don't need the diode for dimming LED lights, but it's good to know for future projects. Off camera, I cut a small piece of aluminum and drilled a hole in it. I just finished painting the middle section, leaving the outer perimeter bare to ensure the glue adheres to aluminum. Here is what I'm planning on doing with it. I need a back plate for my dimmer switch. With my panel modified, time to install the dimmer switch. I only have three of the five switches currently wired. The easiest, of course, is the, this switch here. And this uh, activates the USB and SIG. So power comes in here. And when this switch is on, it sends power to the cigarette lighter, to the 12 volt gauge, as well as the USB uh, plugs. I also have the grounds connected all the way across and I'm cherrying, uh, cherry linking those all the way across to provide a ground for the lights on the switches in the event I choose to use them. Um, if I don't want to use it, as you can see in the center one here, you just simply unplug it. So this switch turns on power to your cigarette lighter, uh, your 12 volt meter and your USBs. This one here is the switch to turn on the LED lights. So this switch here and this dimmer here is what's illustrated below. I have the switch right here and the dimmer right there. Now I made this wiring diagram myself because I wanted to, uh, to make sure that I understood um, exactly uh, what, what I was going to be doing. So I took a look at things online. I took a look at other other sources and I drew this up for my own needs. So coming out 
of the dimmer itself. Okay, this is a little bit in the way here. I'll just try to get it out of the way so you can maybe see behind it. Maybe, well, you can see the three wires right in there, right here. Out of the dimmer, you have a red, a black, and a white. So looking at the diagram here, uh, red connects to the white. So white is your power in. And I actually have it going through this switch here. So this red is connecting to this white. You'll also see that it continues on to the LEDs. So this red and this white, which connect together, go out to this one, which is power out. So the power is coming in here. The switch is activating everything. It's connecting to the white and it's going out. That leaves the black and the red. Here's the black from the dimmer and here's the red. The black from the dimmer, you can see it right here, it simply connects to ground. And the red from the dimmer, this one here, it connects to the ground of the LED lights. So I have three to connect here, uh, which are these three here, and I have one in the van which is gonna plug in as my power in on these two. So I'm gonna go test this now before I start wi wiring the water pump and the lights above the, uh, uh, the kitchen sink. I'm gonna test this now. To facilitate connections and to not place any stress on electrical wires, I hung the switch from the roof of the van while I made the connections. I have all wires labeled. It's just a matter of matching up the labels. Well, moment of truth. I have now placed a fuse in the fuse box and we're live for the first time. <laughs> oh my gosh, it works. Here's a close up of the panel with one connected LED in the distance. Although the dimmer switch itself has its own on off functionality built in, as you can see, I have chosen to install a separate switch just for this purpose. This will allow us to select a brightness level and leave it there, rather than having to manually adjust brightness each time you turn the lights on. I think this is a great place to end this video. All I have left is to install the unit, and you don't need to watch me doing that. I am so pleased to have this chapter behind me. There were so many little fiddly bits in getting to this point, and now I am ready to start building cabinets. Cheers.